So since we are now on the road officially to Spider-Man No Way Home, I'm going to go back and I'm going to review all of the non MCU Spider-Man movie, starting with 2002's Spider-Man, directed by Sam Raimi. We saw the movie in my Discord server, which you can access if you if you become a member of my main channel, Geekdom 101, and join at Tier 2 or higher. You can get into that server and watch movies with us. We did see Spider-Man 2002, and it's the first time I had actually seen this movie in like maybe 10 years. It's been a while, maybe 8 years. So what do I think about Spider-Man 2002? I really, really liked it. I think people have to remember that before the MCU, the movies that kind of changed the game, we had Blade, we had TMNT, we had The Crow. They're all great. But we also had X-Men in 2000 and Spider-Man 2002. And I can remember the hype for this movie. I can remember the trailer like, oh my goodness, Spider-Man is slinging in the city. Like, it's a Spider-Man movie. I can't believe we're getting this. I remember the World Trade Center being in the trailer, which was not in the final movie, except for one shot. It's a reflection off of his eyes. And it was directed by the guy who did Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, An Army of Darkness. So I was hyped. Went to go see it. Liked the movie a lot. This movie, I think, is a perfect blend of comedy and action. I think it has a great villain in Willem Dafoe playing as Norman Osborn. I think Harry Osborn, even though he's more interesting in the sequels, is fine here. And of course, Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man, who has gone down as being a lot of people. I can't say everyone, but a lot of people's favorite Peter Parker. And to be honest, He's good, but I don't think he ever really captured Peter Parker 100%. I think he came close, but when I see him in this movie, he's very dorky, which is kind of how Parker was, but I feel like Parker had an edge about him. And I know he gets edgy in part three. We haven't gotten there yet, but in this movie, the dorkiness value is high. But I will say this, the movie has so many iconic scenes. Like, go web! And then the scene where he's at school and he first uses his powers, catching Mary Jane and all that. I love, love that scene. Love that scene. The scene with uh, Green Goblin's first appearance, you know, we all, when he's like, you know, we'll meet again, Spider-Man! Like a damn, like a comic book villain. Like, I love that. When he first saved Mary Jane. Mary Jane, man. Okay, Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten Dunst is kind of cute in this movie. I'm going to say that. But the way they wrote her in this movie is a little bit weird because she's kind of like triple dick clutching. She's got like a thing where she secretly wants Peter to go after her. And then she's got like a thing where she has like a celebrity crush on Spider-Man. But then she's also got a thing with Harry. So like she can't even decide what she wants, which some of you would probably say is realistic to real life. But... Mary Jane Watson in the comics seemed a lot more sweet. And I don't think they've been able to really capture that in movie form in any of the movies, including the new MJ, Zendaya, in the MCU. Uh, Mary Jane is the kind of woman who doesn't really exist anymore in media. Because you have to remember that Spider-Man was written in the 60s. And I read Spider-Man primarily in the 80s. And I feel like women have become so sexualized. And even though Mary Jane was obviously a sex symbol for a while, the character, you know, she had this wholesome demeanor about her. You know, if you've read old Spider-Man, which I have, you know that Mary Jane was at the girl next door, even though she was a model. And she was way out of Peter's league. But because Peter was a genuine dude who was also very brave and a hero, you know, she fell for him. I think Kirsten Dunst didn't quite capture it here. But I'll be honest, I feel like in the second movie, it's even worse. In this movie, I feel like she's trying to get Peter to confess his feelings for her, but he doesn't do it because he has to hide the fact that he's going to be Spider-Man, which leads to the finale of the movie. Um, and, and that's something that I think, you know, it's a noble thing to do. He doesn't want anybody to go after Mary Jane and hurt her because Spider-Man will have enemies, which he brings up in the second film more than the first one, um, which is why I like the second movie a lot because it, it actually acts like a true sequel. You know, this movie is a standalone story, but you could tell that there was going to be more coming because the Mary Jane storyline was unresolved. I mean, it was genuinely unresolved. You know, um, we've got Willem Dafoe killing it 
as Norman Osborn. He's kind of going a bit on the psychosis route, trying to, you know, trying to really succeed in his business. And I really found it interesting how, you know, now watching the movie again, how he was like a father to Peter, how when Uncle Ben died, Peter didn't really have a father figure and Norman Osborn kind of became that father figure. So near the end of the movie, when they face off and they know each other's identity, you know, that scene was really powerful because Peter had a chance to, you know, when, when Norman was like, you know, join me, Spider-Man, we can work together. Peter said no multiple times in the movie, but I feel like it's interesting that Peter remember what his uncle said with great power comes great responsibility. He was responsible to the people of New York, not to the Green Goblin, even though he wanted that father figure. You know, uh, Norman Osborn was a corrupted man. And Harry didn't even know how corrupt Norman was. I mean, he had no idea what was really going on. And, you know, I'll tell you this. When I first saw the Green Goblin costume in the movie, I did not like it. I've kind of gotten used to it by now. But I was so used to the comic book Green Goblin, which is a regular, like, face, instead of the big metallic one, that it was kind of a shock for me. You know, I'm sure there were many comic fans back then on the message boards complaining about that. I don't remember. It was so long ago. It was almost 20 years ago. But seeing that, you know, um, it, it was weird at first. But they did get the equipment right. The pumpkin bombs and his hovercraft was right. Also, the fact that Spider-Man's webbing is part of his uh, uh, powers and not, you know, like capsules I thought was an interesting and unique idea and I really like when Spider-Man is trying to discover his own powers this movie has a lot of uh metaphors to going through puberty and in some ways it's kind of a coming of age story when you really think about it it kind of is like a coming of age story you know Sam Raimi wasn't really big on superhero movies I mean Army of Darkness is kind of like a superhero movie Quick and the Dead may have been like that but this was a big project for him because Spider-Man when Sony purchased the rights, we're talking about at the time and for many decades, one of the most popular comic characters, maybe the biggest Marvel had, you know, you could argue that. And there was a lot of weight on him, you know, you because there was already other live action Spider-Man movies in the past, right? But he had to do a big blockbuster and he nailed it because Spider-Man is a successful film that even to this day, people still love. People still talk about how great this movie is. And it's not perfect, but I feel like out of the three, this movie's the one that has the least issues. You know, there are some problems that I have with Spider-Man 2, even though the highs, I think, outweigh this one. But this one has the least amount of problems. It's probably the simplest story and the most straightforward plot. And that's what I like about it, the simplicity of it. It's a very easy movie to watch. You can put it in, beginning, middle, and end, and not think about anything else. On top of that, we got Danny Elfman's legendary score. I feel like Danny Elfman was an absolute king in this movie. He was a monster, yo. And we're talking about the same guy who did the soundtrack for Batman. I feel like those are two, I mean... Okay, you got DC's most popular character and Marvel's most popular character, Spider-Man and Batman. And Danny Elfman does the score for both movies. I think that's tremendous. What a tremendous career that guy had. He deserves it. I mean, he's done way more than that. But wow. And this movie has a great, adventurous, whimsical feel to it. Like the movie feels good. It, it It's got its dark moments, but... It's a fun movie, and that to me, in some ways, is important. A fun factor for a film for me is important. Let's not forget J.K. Simmons here portraying J. Jonah Jameson. I mean, his J. Jonah is legendary. He should be the only guy to ever play J. Jonah Jameson. He's always been a great character actor and has won awards for it. J. Jonah Jameson is who he was born to play, point blank. You've got to remember, folks, that at the time, this movie made $100 million opening weekend. That was unheard of back then for a comic book movie. It was, without question, the biggest comic book adaptation of that era. Like, before the MCU, man, Spider-Man from Sony stole it, which is why Spider-Man 
and Sony have been so synonymous with each other. Oh, and I can't even talk about this without talking about the macho man Randy Savage. I mean, that was awesome seeing him in this. And Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell was also here. Bruce Campbell was um, playing the uh, promoter of the ring announcer of the wrestling. Like I love that whole sequence. It wasn't quite like how it was in the comics, but it was close enough. Also, did you guys know that there was a, I don't know if it was a rumor, but I guess um, there was talk. Of Eddie Brock being in this movie. R.C. Everbeck like did Eddie Brock. But they cut the scenes out. Like how would it have been. If, if R.C. Everbeck got to play Eddie Brock. Even in like Spider-Man 2 and 3. You know I wonder how that would have gone. Um, So I mean there's just so much. Stuff to talk about. Stan Lee makes a cameo. Beginning that tradition. Um, this movie really, you know, some are going to say that this movie kind of unofficially began the MCU because of the fact that Toby's going to be in Spider-Man No Way Home and that's going to tie in the MCU to the Sony-verse so the MCU will sort of be retconned and starting here. I don't know about that, but I can tell you that this movie certainly began the trend that the MCU would continue to do, which is the sort of little bit of comedy, a little bit of action, family, fun, comic book movies. This movie's a lot less dark than X-Men was. And it's lighthearted, but it's not. It's still got its dark moments, you know. And its comedy is very much like what the MCU kind of became. So, uh, a very groundbreaking film tonally. And without question, this changed the game. Spider-Man 2002 changed... 2002 Spider-Man changed the game, dude. And I, I think it still holds up. And let me tell you how much of a time capsule it is, bro. Macy Gray was the one performing at the World Unity Fair. Macy mother freaking Gray, dude. Macy Gray was there, dude. And let's not forget the infamous Upside Down Kiss. Like, there are so many iconic scenes in the movie. The way Green Goblin dies and that whole sequence at the end. You know, um, and also the scene with Spider-Man and, and, and him in, this, in the roof. Why didn't he unmask him? Like, I didn't understand that. But uh, still, like, oh, like... Of all the movies, like I said, this one I think is the, I think it's the simplest one. I think it's the easiest one to watch and the one that I think is probably, you know, again, put food in the plate for everybody to eat. So go back and rewatch Spider-Man 2002 and let me know what you think. I mean, a whole generation grew up with this damn movie, so <laughs> there you go. Anyways, I'm going to put an end to this review. Next, I will review Spider-Man 2. What some have said to be the best Spider-Man movie. We'll see. I'll talk to you then.